everyone that's been on the well, the last two films we made. So it's the same crew, basically from um, uh, Killers and Sightseers, and some of us have been on it since Down Terrace. We make a special thing, guys. Four. Four. Some of us can only do three. Yeah. It's clear. But um, everyone else has been on it since since um, uh, Killers. So, I mean, yeah, and, and I met basically everyone from doing other work, so either through doing TV or from um, doing online ads or uh, advertising. Um, but Andy and I met, um, Andy Stark here, met a very, very long time ago when, um, uh, when I was making films when I was a student and he worked in a post-production facility and he was the only program we knew. <laughs> so we had an edit suite, so don't be worried. <laughs> he still is the only one up here. So we, we've got two producers here in the middle, and the DOP here, Laurie, and sound at the end there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've got the whole, the, everyone's here. Um, so Bobby's going to record his mind as the sound mixer, just to, you know. Uh, because sound was really important in this film, I mean, it it's, has an incredible soundscape, really resonant, rich. Do you, can you guys tell us about how you put it together? Um, well, Bobby does all the recording, and I do all the post-production, which is basically I do all the jobs, which on a Hollywood feature film would take about eight people. It would be an ADR recorder, to Foley artists, you know, Foley recorders, all these kind of people. I do all those jobs down to the, right up to the re-recording mix. So, um, I take a wonderful sound that Bobby's recorded on set, Bonanza Genius. Um, and he had to work quite hard on this particular set because it was very difficult to get good sound. With the costumes that they were wearing were quite thick and it was hard for the radio mics and stuff. Yeah, yeah it's, it's tough for everyone to do it in 12 days. Um, and it being a period piece as well, I suppose you can't, uh, you can't have those tubes and players. Yeah, I mean, I, I did, when I did the recce for it, um, I didn't take Bobby, which is always it's well, yeah, a okay. mistake I always make. And um, it was uh, obviously in my ears are uh, completely cloth. And when I went around the field, uh, loads of helicopters must have flown over while I was there, and jets and stuff, which I just ignored because it suited me. But um, when we came to make the film, we realised we were in the fucking flight path, the Biggin Hill. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, when we, the, one of the one of the locations I chose, I managed to choose was actually next to a dual carriageway. Um, all of which, you know, Chinook helicopters, jets, planes, are all things you can't really justify as something that's set in the 17th century. So it, it made everyone's life horrible, didn't it? We had to lose one location because of it, and then. Yeah, and then every day we cried a little bit as helicopters came in. They basically came in and, and they watched us, didn't they? Yeah. They flew in low and they all hung out the door. We were watching us. And they were filming Thor 2. Yeah. The fear was away. Yeah, Thor 2 was filming near us, glamorously. But uh, yeah, they thought we were coming in. Yeah. But it was, it, it, it's just frustrating when you have to wait for stuff, especially when you have to do this fast as work. Um, that's all you can do. Yeah. I don't have to go over, just sit there and think of the next thing you're doing, maybe speed it on a bit, aren't they? Yeah. It was all came out of the wash, right? It did. We got here any chinooks on it now. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> wash. We actually added chinooks to us. Yeah, we did. We put extra chinooks in it. <laughs> <laughs> can I turn to the producers now uh, and how you set up, because this is a very low budget film, 300,000, which you shot in 12 days. What, what were the special, and you, you were just telling me earlier you edited it on your kitchen table, or it was just produced on your kitchen table. Is that what? Well, um, uh, I guess, yeah, I mean, Andy is off the back of the killers and sexes. Um, we all really wanted to make a film that was really quick, and Ben and Amy came up with this amazing idea to do this film in one location that could suit this budget level, which is um, not very big. And so I guess me and Adam have always worked in a way that we kind of do things, if we don't have the money to do things, we do for ourselves. I think that's it. I mean, and we conformed the whole film. And then, yeah, the production office is pretty much in my, my kitchen table. 
But um, I don't think the, the, the film, you know, the film benefited the fact that we all know our stuff pretty well by now. And it's such a tight unit. And, um, and, and uh, you know, it's an amazing experience for all of us, but I think that's the only way to do it if you make small films like this in terms of budget level. You kind of have to do more than your job role. You kind of have to see way more. And, um, but you do it because you love it. And we all love working so much with Ben and Amy and the gang. Yeah. It gives you the flexibility as well. I mean, you never be allowed to make a film like that. You know, that's, that's half the battle is to say what you want, you absolutely want, what you're making, and put you together in a way that gives you the control of the whole thing. And that's us. You know, we could run the whole thing and have one of it, and then you also make a film like that, which you just wouldn't be able to do. It's not a big enough film. Ben edited from his house in Britain, and uh, total, total control of it. I'm sure it's a, it's a big difference when you edit it in your house as opposed to editing in a, an edit suite in Soho. No one tends to come, <laughs> um, especially when you don't live in London. And uh, they're a bit embarrassed about it, which is good. <laughs> so you never see anyone and then you just deliver the final thing. It's the future. <laughs> And finally, also, the, the, the wonderful uh, DOP, uh, Pierre Laurie. Um, I heard recently there was a tweet about that someone had seen the film and announced they wanted to marry you. Or... Yes. <laughs> no, it's because I was so impressed by your work. Yeah, I think it's because he thinks I'm a, I'm a girl. <laughs> it's because of my name. <laughs> you are also married. I'm also married, so I would like to think so about that. How did you shoot the film and what, what, what equipment were you using? What special challenges? Um, we were, we start, started with Dan Terrace, really. We started with, um, uh, it was our first foray into digital cinema, so using um, big, large, sensitive cameras. And so having done um, coolest and sciences like that, we carried on because we, we, it was a, 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 a camera and a workflow that we knew really well. And we, used, um, we were using red cameras. Um, and we uh, used the Epic, Epic X, so we shot a 5K. And uh, obviously it gave us a very good sense uh, and lots of really, really high quality. And um, what? And it, it relatively cheaply, I think, it's a relatively affordable camera in terms of getting hold of it. But it, what he was getting was, was um, what it gives you is a really, really, really high quality camera, but something that we know how to use very well and very quickly. And it means that you can, you, you, your images are basically Hollywood quality, if you want to put it like that, but we know how to use it very quickly and, and uh, for that amount of money and time. And the, and the decisions go black and white? Whose decisions is that Ben's? Well, yeah, that's a, it's something that we talked about for a long time, um, about the simplicity of it. And, um, and, uh, and um, yeah, and it solved, actually solved lots of problems for us in terms of working that quickly. Because it meant that we didn't have to stop for sun or, or it, it, it just it smoothed over some of the continuity problems that you might have with different colours of... We actually had a badge made and we'll like it meant it would be all right in black and white. Yeah. Because <laughs> everything, it kind of just, it, it just made everything a bit more, um, uh, just even down some of the continuity problems. So, and what was it about the kind of lustrousness, the lustre of black and white that was, it, was conveying what you wanted to convey? Um, we, Laurie and I did a load of tests over the, the in the year, uh, well, was, was it even a year after Sizes? It was, wasn't it? Just about. So we started shooting a lot of digital stuff and looking at black and white. Um, and one of the things we, we, we can't, the conclusions we came from from the tests were that the, um, you know, the, the, you know, this is not much of an epiphany. It's, you know, everyone's going to know what I'm you know, about to say. But basically, the, the, the black and white deals in texture and colour, deals in blocks of chroma. And when you look at images in black and white, I think you look straight to the faces. And you look to the everyone's faces aligned, and you see the eyes very clearly. And you see the clothes, the creases in the clothes. Where if you look at the same image in colour, you look at the sky, you look at the colour of the tunics you get the colour of the grass and I think that that's a distraction before you get to the, the, the real meat of an image which is processing what the faces are going through. So that was one of the main reasons. But also looking back at cinema like um, uh, Watkins, Collard and, and Brownlow uh, and Stanley and, uh, and also experimental kind of um, 
sixties and seventies, you know, London film co-op stuff. So that that was kind of in the back of my head as well. And that this that, that amazing strobing effect you had. Uh, I was told that the TV version has that has not quite the same as been turned down. Yeah, well, there's a thing called the Harding box, which is a, an epilepsy test to stop people having fits, which is fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, just, we just got away with it as a, a quite badly worded warning at the beginning, which you would have forgotten about by the time it happened. But they, um, yeah, the, the thing about flickering imagery is that it's not about how fast you cut, it's about the differences in contrast. So if you have an image that goes black, white, black, white, black, white, really quick, then that can induce epilepsy. But if you have lots of grey scale images, one off the other frame cut, then that's not necessarily something that will make you have that reaction. So in the film, they, they tested it for TV and there was a couple of instances where it flipped the Harding box and said, oh, this is dangerous for ep if you suffer from epilepsy. So then those shots were, um, the contrast was adjusted on them. So the edit was the same, but it was not as hard. But this is a totally different experience because it's so massive. You know, apologies to anyone who felt ill. <laughs> and, and the script is, um, was written by your wife. Um, and, and when did she write it? And is it, is it, uh, has it been around for a while or is it a recent thing she's written? Uh, the script had been kicking around for 10 years and I've written very many drafts of it. And the last draft I gave to Amy and said, do you want to have a look at this? And it was called um, uh, the, Giant of, uh, the Bride of Gant, the last draft. And then it came back to me called The Field in England, and the character names had all changed, <laughs> and the dialogue had changed, <laughs> the incidents in the script had changed. So everything had changed. It had fucking changed, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and the last bit of writing I did was to cross my name off it. Um, but not in a bad, not in a huffy way, any kind of, okay, all right, it's better than my script was, kind of a way. But that's our, that's our collaboration, our relationship in writing. That's how it works. We've, we've been writing together for 20 years, so, you know, you learn to roll with the punches. <laughs> and, well, you were telling me earlier one of the reasons you wanted to make this film very quickly is because otherwise there'd be, you are working on another project and you just wanted to get something out there, otherwise you knew you'd never have time to do it. Is that, is that right? Yeah, it's kind of that we, we, going into the next project that we knew was coming on the horizon was quite a big budget thing and we knew that we would be disappearing down the rabbit hole about production for at least two or three years and we didn't want to be in the position of um, I didn't want to not make a film for that long so you know we had the opportunity to make this and, it, and it's always it's always there after we made Down Terrace it's something we, we kind of always promised ourselves that, that there would never have to be a gap in filming because we could always produce something that was, didn't cost that much money but was still enjoyable to make and you know and was f f fulfilling um, artistically wouldn't be a compromise, so um, so yeah, we thought, right, we're going to make this, and we did. And how, how have you sort of dealt with people's expectations, because uh, I'm sure a lot of them, do, have people been surprised that you've made this kind of film at this point? I think people have been pretty generous about it, much more than I thought, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. I thought we were going to get slaughtered in the press about it, and, uh, but the, the whole, the general kind of feeling has been really positive, so... Um, yeah, I mean, I don't generally think about what the audience is going to think, sorry, guys, but, uh, you know, we make the stuff and if we like it, then we're happy and then we put it out and then, you know, so be it after that. And, and the casting and Reese Shearsmith, obviously the major, uh, an excellent in it. Uh, how did his name come up or did you always have him in mind? I met him at um, the ICA when uh, the first screening of Down Terrace He'd been working with um, Michael Smiley on Burke and Hare, and I'm a massive League of Gentlemen fan, and I was quite overcome. And I was like, oh, oh, and he said, I liked it. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> so later I got to meet him through my agent and had a uh, cup of tea with him and a chat, and he seemed to indicate that he was up for stuff. So that's, in, that's basically the way we work. And then once we heard that, Amy kind of tailored the script to, to fit Reese, and it went from there, really. Um, would anyone like to ask a question? Yes. Sorry if this is a ridiculous question, but 
When you're making a film that involves the consumption of psychedelic drugs, do you ever consider that the audience watching the film be taking psychedelic drugs and set up scenes to make the experience more trippy for people taking psychedelic drugs? Um, I think, did everyone hear that? Yeah. Uh, I'll, 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 uh, basically, I'm going to paraphrase you now, you can stop me if I do it wrong. Um, the, the question was that um, if, do we consider making do we consider that people be taking psychedelic drugs as they watch the film and whether we tailored it to that thought? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> Kinda. I mean, we, we were thinking about we wanted to make like a midnight film, um, and I hadn't seen one for a long time, you know, and I wanted to make something that would play. At that, for that kind of midnight audience and also a kind of student audience in a way that, and they haven't been catered for for a long time in that respect. Yeah. Um, I don't think that you have to obviously be on drugs to enjoy the film, but you know, it might be an experience. <laughs> um, but, uh, but it's also from the perspective of having taken drugs as well, I imagine. <laughs> Strategy behind the film, so I know it was quite a big risk to do what you guys did in terms of releasing it with Blu ray and TV and cinema on the same day. I was just wondering what was your thought process? Was it around getting as many people to watch a film, or what was your kind of thinking behind that? I, mean, I think it, it's, it's difficult because people think you're kind of nuts, but having made this is the fourth thing I've made, that we've done that, and you, you just know the nuts and bolts of how it all works, and then the reality of it is. You've got to think what this film would have done if it had just been a traditional release and you'd gone out there and flogged it to distribute it. And what they would have done is put it on the ICA for a week and then it would have disappeared for nine months and then it would have come out on DVD. And if you live in Wales, you'd never see it. And it's like, it just seems ridiculous. It's a, it's a sort of reality of the situation. I think all of us would love everyone to see it in the cinema. You know, and it should come out on hundreds of screens and you, know, you should get a nip from Iron Man 3 to see this. You know, and that'd be great. But, and I kind of think people would go if it was just uh, given the opportunity, but it just doesn't work like that. And you know, we don't have the P&A money, we don't have, it's just, it's boring realities of where everyone's at. And it's up to people like Picture House that are prepared to take a risk on something and, and do something interesting and, you know, festivals like this, and, you know, and, you know, so people have to go out and support that and people are there and doing it. So, you know, we're working with those people rather than against them. And that was really, it was just trying to get as many people as possible to see it. And actually the reality was it went up in screens because we could use Channel 4 and Film 4 to advertise the film. And so, you know, I think cinema's a unique experience. And if, if you don't think, if cinemas don't think it is a unique experience, they're not doing it right, are they? So it, there isn't any crossover to me. And I, I think I want to see something in cinema, but sometimes you just aren't going to be able to. So it hasn't hindered it at all, but I think it's actually helped it. I think definitely, I think, um, I think it's been really brave and I think it's, the buzz around the film has been amazing. So I, I commend you for that, it's really well done. Thanks. <laughs> Is it too early to say how it sort of performs in a different... No, it's all on the internet. We're horribly laid bare, exposed, and we're the sort of fools that everyone can find out whether we're idiots or not. But no, it's, I mean, if it's all on the internet, it came out today, like the numbers and stuff, so you can just look and... Google it and you'll find it, but it's, it's good, I mean, it's done better than everyone wanted it to do. It was a kind of an expectation and it succeeded that. Film, film 4 is saying it's done really well, internet trolls are saying, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Fuck. None of us have bought a Rolls Royce <laughs> quite yet, but... Um, uh, there's, it's not just multimedia, you've got, you've got a beer, right? There's a beer, there's a... No, um, there's a that's what I mean. Basically, the whole, the whole thing was based around that beer. <laughs> they came to us, we got, they said, we've got a beer to fog, what can you do? It's called a field in England, and we're like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> that's a lot. And so, guys, tell us a bit more about this, the, the, the vinyl record that's coming out. Uh, limited edition. <laughs> I don't know anything about the vinyl record. You do, you were, you were on it. I've got a side on the vinyl record, which is nice. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's three sides of Jim Williams, who does the kind of uh, melodic part of the score. And it's got one side of the uh, kind of six-minute 
psychedelic freak out sequence, which is uh, and it's got bank mass on it as well. Oh, it's got bank mass on it as well. Don't take all the credit for the music. Okay. He's here. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'm very pleased about it coming out. It's great. It's quite fine now. It's going to be safe. Let us have this. Yeah. 500 copies of it. 400. We've got to give 100 away because we get people get upset. Journalists. So you can. 100 away. I didn't know it. Carson. Carson. Uh, any other questions? He, he says a special planning you have to do to pull off something like that in 12 days on any level because I imagine it's a major push. Um, the, the main thing with making something that quick, and, it, and you know, in the history of cinema, it's not that quick. You know, it's like there's a lot of Roger Corbin films that turn around quicker, and Shot Corridor was done in 12 days. You know, but it, it's about planning. It's about pragmatic filmmaking. So you. Once you know what you're going to do, how much it's going to cost, and how many days you like to shoot on, then you write the script rather than the other way around. It's when you write the script that's full of locations and actors and special effects and set in space and, and underwater with CG creatures with hair, and, and then they tell you that it's going to cost 300 grand, and then you, you're fucked. But, and that's when budgets become. Sorry. That's when budgets become a problem. But when you um, when you know what it is and you plan it from the start, then then it, then not so much. And I, you know, I felt that um, the, the the whole shoot for me was never a compromise. We never we never went over with we went over ten minutes one day. I mean, that was uh, the worst we ever. It's just the light more than anything. Yeah, um, and so it it wasn't like a kind of horrific student film where you know you shoot for twenty hours and. Everyone falls out. It was very cool and calm and calculated and, and organised. So, um, and I like working like that. And I, and I got a taste of it after Dan Terrace, and I, and I thought that was uh, it's quite a perfectly uh, interesting uh, way to work. It's not, you know, and as long as you've set the parameters up of it at the beginning, so that um, obviously the field is not there's no lighting in it because it pretty much because it's, um, you had some light panels, didn't you? But there's not much light in it because it's all available light in outdoors. So you, once you've eliminated all that aggravation that you normally get with filmmaking, then actually it's all about operating and performance. And in a two week, in a 12 day period, you probably get as much time um, with actors as you might do on an eight week shoot if you're having to lug loads of lights about. So um, in a way, uh, for, for us in the world screw. I've heard that in the past you do quite a lot of improvisational film scenes uh, to the script and then do a bit more, I'm sure, much to the grievance of producers, um, especially things like Down Terrace in the past. Was that the case in this film, or did you stick more to the script since it's more stylized? Um, improvisation in the films I've done have never been to the grievance of the producers. Okay. Usually because it, because I work really quick, so it's not like you know I'm I'm kind of standing there going I want more time to film this. Usually we're way ahead of schedule because we work fast because of our crew. Um, but on this one, we tried. We thought we would carry on the same technique. What I usually what I've done on the first three movies is um, we do improvising. We do we have a script and then we do a, a, a take on the script and then we do a take that was paraphrasing the script. So not, not just making stuff up, but putting the script back into their own words and then we go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards between those two positions and those two approaches just feed off each other and get you know realistic performances as far as I, I can see. But on, uh, we tried it on field and it's impossible because of the language and there's, no, there's nothing for the actors to call upon because they've never lived in the past. It's tricky. I remember uh, the, them trying it, and all they would do is just say the script, but with pauses in yeah, between yeah, yeah. it, because they not have any language to go, do. Yeah, you need a bit of something. <laughs> so it was a, it was a cock up, and it didn't work. And um, actually, there's one improvisational line in that film, and, it, and it's um, Ryan Pope going, "Let's all not be a bunch of cunts," <laughs> which, which I thought was brilliant. But after that, we gave up. It wasn't going to work. So. Um, uh, yeah, uh, there, there wasn't any improvisation in this film. Down here. The raking is terrible for you, isn't it? And to run up and down these stairs. Is... Hello. Hello. I'm, I'm just wondering.
and with the Civil War um, setting, were there any particular uh, political, social ideas being explored? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we, we came at it from this idea that, the, that, you know, it was a moment in time where Britain was um, uh, changing completely, you know, it's the big, for, for as far as I understand it from history, it's the beginning of the Western world, you know, it's been a democracy and the setting up of a lot of the, the kind of systems that we're dealing with now. And that was one of the things that, that appealed to us all, and appealed to Amy about it. I'm speaking for her now. When she sees this, I'll probably get bollocking for doing it wrong. But, um, that was one of the things that really um, appealed to us about it. Um, and also that we, we, did, we did this research and we found that, you know, that, that there's plenty of kind of written diaries by um, people, but, but the actual the lower ranks, there was no recorded history for them, and no one knows what they wore, and they didn't really, their stories weren't told. And that, that was kind of appealing. We wanted this idea that you, that, that anything could have, like, you know, at that point in history, it was so radical, and everyone, loads of people were thinking in, in very, very different way, and reinvent, reinventing the country, that there might be little pockets of the country that had this thought that, that weren't reported, and that, you know, that anything, you know, the way that the whole thing had happened is that people had come from nowhere, like Cromwell had kind of, he wasn't like the most expected person to take over the country at that point. But other people were there in, in the mix that could have done. And these guys were, there, were in a corner kind of doing their own thing, which is really important to them, but they could have risen up and been and, and taken over the country. So um, it was just looking at those bits of like, forgotten history in a way. Um, that was one of, the, one of the things we were thinking about, and that the field was like a blank uh, page where the new country was being written on. Um, but also it was in a story about men who didn't know each other, getting to know each other, and, and then, then Whitehead's face of dark with being a coward to be a hero, so you know, there was a lot of stuff we were thinking about. slippery about it. Like there's no, even though you know people have been saying it specifically in the Civil War, there's no dates in the film. It's very, it's very slippery about when it's actually set. Um, and the rooms themselves that he vomits up, some of them are real rooms and some of them are made up. And what we wanted to do is have a, create a kind of um, look at magic, but create another like side history of it that was part of this um, this piece of work. So it wasn't, and it's was a similar thing we did in Kill List as well, so we didn't want to take actual religions and talk about, or talk about paganism directly. We wanted to make up our own stuff and make it, it's a fancy world, which these things exist within. So, yeah, there's rooms on those stones, but they're not, some of them are specific and some of them are not. And the magic... Is there one from the Orkneys? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But, it, but that stuff was, yeah, it, it's part of the nefarious plan of the master, basically. That Harry sends um, Whitehead in to, you know, to retrieve his paperwork. Um, what was it about the uh, English Civil War setting that you thought would make it good for a psychedelic film? And then, um, was it always going to be psychedelic, or did you have the Civil War idea first and then it came back to that? Um, the psychedelic stuff came from research that we've done into mushroom circles and we've read about mushroom circles and there's this really interesting thing about them being a um, portal into another dimension uh, into, a, into a fairy realm and people were scared of them and if you went inside and they thought if you stepped inside a mushroom circle they thought you couldn't get out and the time moved differently within that circle um, and the only way to get out of a mushroom circle is by four men on a rope pulling you out so this is like English folk Law and um, and that kind of inspired it, and then we started, you know, thinking about magic mushrooms as well and how they would work, and the, the way that 
kind of magicians and magic men would walk around with them ground up into dust and blow them into people's faces, um, the psycho side into people's faces, and then they would hallucinate and think they were seeing magic. So that kind of got basically put into the pot of, of, of the plot. Thanks. Where, where was the uh, location? Was that easy to get to? Did everyone just go home afterwards? We cool no. hotel or something. Um, we were in Sasari Farm. Um, we also had the same hotel. I think um, when you're filming like that and you're spending each other days, you don't want to go back home because it's just a bit weird. So we were supposed to stay in tents, weren't we? Initially, yeah. that was the idea. Yeah. And wear a costume, but that's. I was going to be living history. We're going to do it as living history. But realised that once you've got, if you save money by having a cast of six, so their clothes don't change if you then dress the rest of the crew in, in, in period costume. Well, actually, yeah, I worked the numbers up. It was yeah, really expensive. it was really expensive, <laughs> which really broke my heart. <laughs> and we had to have like a, din- a ditch shed with all the technical stuff. Yeah, it was not going to work, was it? And uh, that, that was the idea that we were all going to live in tents and do a li- doing it as living history. But um, and was going to cook. Yeah, but it, it never happened. Such a missed opportunity for a <laughs> But how, how many fields did you look at before you found? Um, I think we looked at quite a few because there's this thing that obviously Ben um, wanted it to be filled with a, a level of grass that was quite high um, because he wanted men to hide in it. So, and then we had to start thinking, well, what's it, the grass going to be like in, in September and when you're in July when you hit the fuck nose? Um, so we got to the farmers, didn't we? He lied, didn't he, basically? He like, totally you know, lied. He didn't lie, he was slightly <laughs> wrong about it. So you know, we saw it when he was up here and he said, oh no, it'd be like this. And it wasn't. No, it yeah. wasn't. So they had to really hide in the grass. <laughs> but we were lucky at the field because it was, it was um, a set of it was sands, which actually we didn't realise at the time. But... Yeah, weirdly, yeah. It's like a, the top soil's like that and then it's sanded all the way down. You can kind of see it in the... The way the ease that they dig that hole is like incredible. Because you know, if it was anywhere else, you know, it would be clay and stone, and it would be impossible. But yeah, that was quite surreal, wasn't it? Because it doesn't look like normal earth at all. No, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> it sort of adds to the whole mystery. Yeah, it's yeah. a normal feel that would be stuck in the mud, and really, it's just been absolutely dreadful. And and we have to be really careful to feel because we've got we've probably got lots of your filmmakers. We've got a big crew. They kind of ruin things by their sound. So we have to constantly be careful of not ruining the field. So you had all these paths around the field. It's a big concern, actually, there, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we've done shoots 